The way to hell has now been made wide. From the visions of St. Bridget of Sweden. In a mystical vision given to St. Bridget of Sweden, Christ explains how he opened the way to paradise and how he showed his ardent love by suffering throughout his incarnation. The Lord Jesus also reveals how the path to hell has now been made wide, and the way to heaven has become narrow. This Virgo Putens production includes Book 2, Chapters 15 through 16 from Prophecies and Revelations by St. Bridget of Sweden. Chapter 15 You are wondering why I am telling you such things and why I am revealing such marvels to you. Is it for your sake alone? Of course not. It is for the edification and salvation of others. You see, the world was like a kind of wilderness, in which there was one road leading down to the great abyss. In the abyss were two chambers. One was so deep that it had no bottom, and the people who went down into it never came up again. The second was not so deep or frightening as the first. Those who went down into it had some hope of help. They experienced longing and delay, but not misery. Darkness, but not torment. The people who lived in this second chamber kept sending their cries daily to the magnificent city nearby that was filled with every good thing and every delight. They cried out heartily, for they knew the way to the city. However, the wild forest was so thick and dense that they were unable to cross it, or make any advance because of its density, and they had not the strength to forge a path through it. What was their cry? Their cry was this, O oh God, come and give us help. Show us the way and enlighten us. We are waiting for you. We cannot be saved by anyone but you. This cry came to my hearing in heaven and moved me to mercy. Appeased by their crying, I came to the wilderness like a pilgrim. But before I began to work and make my way, a voice spoke out ahead of me, saying, The axe has been laid to the tree. This voice was none other than John the Baptist. He was sent before me, and cried out in the desert, The axe has been laid to the tree, which is to say, Let the human race be ready, for the axe is now ready, and he has come to prepare a way to the city, and is uprooting every obstacle. When I came, I worked from sunrise to sunset, that is, I devoted myself to the salvation of humankind from the time of my incarnation until my death on the cross. At the start of my undertaking, I took flight into the wilderness away from my enemies, more precisely, from Herod, who was pursuing me. I was put to the test by the devil and suffered persecution from men. Later, while enduring much toil, I ate and drank and sinlessly complied with other natural needs in order to build up the faith and to show that I had truly taken a human nature. While I prepared the way to the city, that is, to heaven, and uprooted all the obstacles that had sprung up, brambles and thorns scratched my side and harsh nails wounded my hands and feet. My teeth and my cheeks were badly mishandled. I bore it with patience, and did not turn back, but went ahead all the more zealously. Like an animal driven by starvation that, when it sees a man holding a spear against it, charges into the spear in its desire to get at that man. And the more the man thrusts the spear into the entrails of the animal, the more the animal thrusts itself against the spear in its desire to get at the man until at least its entrails and entire body are pierced through and through. In like manner, 
I burned with such love for the soul that, when I beheld and experienced all these harsh torments, the more eager men were to kill me, the more ardent I became to suffer for the salvation of souls. Thus I made my way in the wilderness of this world, and prepared a road through my blood and sweat. The world might well be called a wilderness, since it was lacking in every virtue and remained a wilderness of vice. It had only one road on which everyone was descending into hell, the damned toward damnation, the good towards darkness. I heard mercifully their long-standing desire for future salvation, and came like a pilgrim in order to work. Unknown to them in my divinity and power, I prepared the road that leads to heaven. My friends saw this way and observed the difficulties of my work and my eagerness of heart, and many of them followed me in joy for a long time. But now there has been a change in the voice that used to cry out, Be ready! My road has been altered, and thickets and thorn bushes have grown up, and those who were advancing on it have halted. The way to hell has been opened up. It is broad, and many people travel by it. However, in order not to let my road become altogether forgotten and neglected, my few friends still travel it in their longing for their heavenly homeland like birds moving from bush to bush, hidden, as it were, and serving me out of fear, since everyone nowadays thinks that to travel by the way of the world leads to happiness and joy. For this reason, because my road has become narrow, while the road to the world has been widened, I am now shouting out to my friends in the wilderness, that is, in the world, that they should remove the thorn bushes and brambles from the road leading to heaven, and recommend my road to those who are making their way. As it is written, Blessed are those who have not seen me and have believed. Likewise, happy are they who now believe in my words and put them into practice. As you see, I am like a mother who runs out to meet her roving son. She holds out a light for him on the way so that he can see the road. In her love, she goes to meet him on the way and shortens his journey. She goes up to him and embraces and greets him. With love like that, I shall run out to meet my friends and all the people returning to me and I shall give their hearts and souls the light of divine wisdom. I will embrace them with glory, and surround them with the heavenly court where there is neither heaven above nor earth below, but only the vision of God, where there is neither food nor drink, but only the enjoyment of God. The road to hell is open for the wicked, once they enter into it, they will never come up again. They will be without glory or bliss, and will be filled with misery and everlasting reproach. This is why I speak these words, and reveal this love of mine, so that those who have turned away may turn back to me, and recognize me, their Creator, whom they have forgotten. Christ's words to the bride about why he speaks with her rather than with others better than she, and about three things commanded, three forbidden, three permitted, and three recommended to the bride by Christ, a most excellent lesson. Chapter 16 Many people wonder why I speak with you and not with others who live a better life and have served me for a longer time. I answer them by way of a parable. A certain lord owned several vineyards in several different regions. The wine of each vineyard has the particular taste of the region where it comes from. Once the wine has been pressed, 
The owner of the vineyards sometimes drinks the mediocre and weaker wine and not the better kind. If any of those present sees him and asks their lord why he does so, he will answer that this particular wine tasted good and sweet to him at the time. This does not mean that the Lord gets rid of the better wines, or holds them in disdain, but that he reserves them for his use and privilege on an appropriate occasion, each of them for the occasion for which it is suited. This is the way I deal with you. I have many friends whose life is sweeter to me than honey, more delicious than any wine, brighter in my sight than the sun. However, It pleased me to choose you in my spirit, not because you are better than they are, or equal to them, or better qualified, but because I wanted to. I who can make sages out of fools, and saints out of sinners. I did not grant you so great a grace because I hold the others in disdain. Rather, I am reserving them for another use and privilege, as justice demands." Humble yourself then in every way, and do not let anything trouble you but your sins. Love everyone, even those who seem to hate and slander you, for they are only providing you with a greater opportunity to win your crown. Three things I command you to do. Three things I command you not to do. Three things I permit you to do. Three things I recommend you to do. I command you to do three things. First, to desire nothing but your God. Second, to cast off all pride and arrogance. Third, always to hate the lust of the flesh. Three things I order you not to do. First, neither to love vain, indecent speech, nor, second, excessive eating and superfluity in other things, and third, to flee from worldly merriment and frivolity. I permit you to do three things. First, to sleep moderately for the sake of good health. Second, to carry out temperate vigils to train the body. Third, to eat moderately for the strength and sustenance of your body. I recommend three things to you. First, to take pains to fast and carry out good works that earn the promise of the kingdom of heaven. Second, to dispose of your possessions for the glory of God. Third, I counsel you to think on two things continually in your heart. First, think on all that I have done for you by suffering and dying for you. Such a thought stirs up love for God. Second, consider my justice and the coming judgment. This instills fear in your mind. Finally, there is a fourth thing which I both order and command and recommend and permit. This is to obey as you ought. I order this inasmuch as I am your God. I command you not to act otherwise inasmuch as I am your Lord. I permit this to you, inasmuch as I am your bridegroom. I also recommend it, inasmuch as I am your friend. From Prophecies and Revelations of St. Bridget of Sweden Christ's Words to the Bride about how God's divinity can truly be named virtue and about the manifold downfall of humankind instigated by the devil, and about the manifold remedy to aid humankind that was given and provided for through Christ. Chapter 17 The Son of God spoke to the bride, saying, Do you firmly believe that what the priest holds in his hands is the body of God? She answered, I firmly believe that, just as the word sent to Mary was made flesh and blood in her womb, so too that which I now see in the hands of the priest I believe to be true God and man. The Lord answered her, 
I am the same who am speaking to you, remaining eternally in the divine nature, having become human in the womb of the Virgin, but without losing my divinity. My divinity can rightly be named virtue, since there are two things in it, power most powerful, the source of all power, and wisdom most wise, the source and seat of all wisdom. In this divine nature, all things that exist are ordered wisely and rationally. There is not one little title in heaven that is not in it and that has not been established and foreseen by it. Not a single atom on earth, not one spark in hell, is outside its rule and can hide itself from its foreknowledge. Do you wonder why I said, Not one little title in heaven? Well, a title is the final stroke on a glossed word. Indeed, God's word is the final stroke on all things, and was ordained for the glorification of all things. Why did I say, not a single atom on earth, if not because all earthly things are transitory? Not even atoms, however small they are, are outside of God's plan and providence. Why did I say, not one spark in hell? if not because there is nothing in hell except envy. Just as a spark comes from fire, so all kinds of evil and envy come from the unclean spirits, with the result that they and their followers always have envy, but never love of any kind. Therefore, perfect knowledge and power are in God, which is why each thing is so arranged that nothing is greater than God's power, nor can anything be caused to be made contrary to reason. But all things have been made rationally, suitable to the nature of each thing. The divine nature, then, inasmuch as it can rightly be named virtue, showed its greatest virtue in the creation of the angels. It created them for its own glory and for their delight, so that they might have charity and obedience, charity by which they love none but God, obedience by which they obey God in all things. Some of the angels went wickedly astray and wickedly set their will against these two things. They turned their will directly against God so much so that virtue became odious to them, and, therefore, that which was opposed to God became dear to them. Because of this disordered direction of their will, they deserved to fall. It was not that God caused their fall, but they themselves brought it about through the abuse of their own knowledge. When God saw the reduction in the numbers of the heavenly host that had been caused through their sin, he again showed the power of his divinity. For he created human beings in body and soul. He gave them two goods, namely the freedom to do good and the freedom to avoid evil, because, given that no more angels were to be created, it was fitting that human beings should have the freedom of rising, if they wished, to angelic rank. God also gave the human soul two goods, namely a rational mind in order to distinguish opposite from opposite, and better from best, and fortitude in order to persevere in the good. When the devil saw this love of God for mankind, he considered thus in his envy. So then, God has made a new thing that can rise up to our place and by its own efforts gain that which we lost through neglect. If we can deceive him and cause his downfall, he will cease his efforts, and then he will not rise up to such a rank. Then, Having thought out a plan of deception, they deceived the first man and prevailed over him with my just permission. But how and when was the man defeated? To be sure, when he left off virtue and did what was forbidden, 
when the serpent's promise pleased him more than obedience to me. Due to this disobedience, he could not live in heaven, since he had despised God, and not in hell either, since his soul, using reason, carefully examined what he had done, and had contrition for his crime. For that reason, the God of virtue, considering human wretchedness, arranged a kind of imprisonment, or place of captivity, where people might come to recognize their weakness, and atone for their disobedience, until they should deserve to rise to the rank they had lost. The devil, meanwhile, taking this into consideration, wanted to kill the human soul by means of ingratitude. Injecting his filth into the soul, he so darkened her intellect that she had neither the love nor fear of God. God's justice was forgotten, and his judgment scorned. For that reason, God's goodness and gifts were no longer appreciated, but fell into oblivion. Thus God was not loved, and the human conscience was so darkened that humanity was in a wretched state and fell into even greater wretchedness. Although humanity was in such a state, still God's virtue was not lacking. Rather, he revealed his mercy and justice. He revealed his mercy when he revealed to Adam and other good people that they would obtain help at a predetermined time. This stirred up their fervor and love for God. He also revealed his justice through the flood in Noah's day which filled human hearts with the fear of God. Even after that, the devil still did not leave off further molesting humankind, but attacked it by means of two other evils. First, he inspired faithlessness in people. Second, hopelessness. He inspired faithlessness in order that people might not believe in the word of God, but would attribute his wonders to fate. He inspired hopelessness, lest they hope to be saved, and obtain the glory they had lost. The God of virtue supplied two remedies to fight these two evils. Against hopelessness he offered hope, giving Abram a new name and promising him that from his seed there would be born the one who would lead him and the imitators of his faith back to the lost inheritance. He also appointed prophets, to whom he revealed the manner of redemption and the times and places of his suffering. With respect to the second evil of faithlessness, God spoke to Moses, and revealed his will and the law to him, and backed his words up with portents and deeds. Although all this was done, still the devil did not desist from his evil, constantly urging humankind on to do worse sins. He inspired two other attitudes in the human heart. First, that of regarding the law as unbearable, and losing peace of mind over trying to live up to it. Second, he inspired the thought that God's decision to die and suffer out of charity was too incredible and far too difficult to believe. Again, God provided two further remedies for these two evils. First, he sent his own son into the womb of the virgin, so that nobody would lose peace of mind over how hard the law was to fulfill. Since, having assumed a human nature, his son fulfilled the requirements of the law, and then made it less strict. With respect to the second evil, God displayed the very height of virtue. The Creator died for creation, the Righteous One for sinners. Innocent, he suffered to the last drop, as had been foretold by the prophets. Even then the wickedness of the devil did not cease. But again he rose up against humanity, inspiring two further evils. First, he inspired the human heart to hold my words in contempt, and, second, to let my deeds fall into oblivion. 
God's virtue has again begun to indicate two new remedies against these two evils. The first is to return to my words, to honor and to undertake to imitate my deeds. This is why God has led you in spirit. He has also revealed his will on earth to his friends through you, for two reasons in particular. The first is in order to reveal God's mercy, so that people might learn to recall the memory of God's love and suffering. The second is to remind them of God's justice and to make them fear the severity of my judgment. Therefore, tell this man that, given my mercy has already come, he should bring it out into the light so that people might learn to seek mercy and to beware of the judgment on themselves. Moreover, tell him that, although my words have been written down, still they must first be preached and put into practice. You can understand this by way of a metaphor. When Moses was about to receive the law, a staff was made and two stone tablets were hewn. Nevertheless, he did not work miracles with the staff until there was a need for it, and the occasion demanded it. When the acceptable time came, then there was a show of miracles, and my words were proved by deeds. Likewise, when the new law arrived, first my body grew and developed until a suitable time, and from then on my words were heard. However, although my words were heard, still they did not have force and strength in themselves until accompanied by my deeds. And they were not fulfilled until I fulfilled all things that had been foretold about me through my passion. It is the same now. Although my loving words have been written down and should be conveyed to the world, still they cannot have any force until they have been completely brought out into the light. About three wonderful things that Christ has done for the bride, and about how the sight of angels is too beautiful and that of devils too ugly for human nature to bear, and about why Christ has condescended to come as a guest to a widow like her. Chapter 18 I have done three wonderful things for you. You see with spiritual eyes. You hear with spiritual ears. With the physical touch of your hand, you feel my spirit in your living breast. You do not see the sight you see as it is in fact. For if you saw the spiritual beauty of the angels and of holy souls, your body could not bear to see it, but would break like a vessel, broken and decayed due to the soul's joy at the sight. If you saw the demons as they are, you would either go on living in great sorrow, or you would die a sudden death at the terrible sight of them. This is why spiritual beings appear to you as if they had bodies. The angels and souls appear to you in the likeness of human beings, who have soul and life, because angels live by their spirit. The demons appear to you in a form that is mortal and belongs to mortality, such as in the form of animals or other creatures. Such creatures have a mortal spirit, since when their body dies, their spirit dies too. However, devils do not die in spirit, but are forever dying and live forever. Spiritual words are spoken to you by means of analogies, since you cannot grasp them otherwise. The most wonderful thing of all is that you feel my spirit move in your heart. Then she replied, O oh my Lord, Son of the Virgin, why have you condescended to come as a guest to such a base widow? 
who is poor in every good work, and so weak in understanding and discernment, and ridden with sin for so long? He answered her, I can do three things. First, I can make a poor person rich, and a foolish person of little intelligence capable and intelligent. I am also able to restore an aged person to youth. It is like the phoenix that brings together dried twigs. Among them is the twig of a certain tree that is dry by nature, on the outside and warm on the inside. The warmth of the sunbeams comes to it first and kindles it, and then all the twigs are set on fire from it. In the same way, you should gather together the virtues by which you can be restored from your sins. Among them, you should have a piece of wood that is warm on the inside and dry on the outside. I mean your heart, which should be dry and pure from all worldly sensuality on the outside, and so full of love on the inside, that you want nothing and yearn for nothing but me. Then the fire of my love will come into the heart first, and in that way you will be enkindled with all the virtues. Thoroughly burned by them and purged from sins, you will arise like the rejuvenated bird, having put off the skin of sensuality. From Book Two of Prophecies and Revelations by St. Bridget of Sweden Chapter 19 Christ's words to the bride about how God speaks to his friends through his preachers and through sufferings, and about Christ as symbolized by an owner of bees, and the church by a beehive and Christians by bees and about why bad Christians are allowed to live among good ones. I am your God. My spirit has led you to hear and see and feel, to hear my words, to see visions, to feel my spirit with the joy and devotion of your soul. All mercy is found in me, together with justice, and there is mercy in my justice. I am like a man who sees his friends fall away from him, down onto a road where there is a horrible yawning gap, out of which it is impossible to climb. I speak to these friends through those people who have an understanding of Scripture. I speak with a lash. I warn them of their danger. But they just act contrarywise. They head for the impasse and do not care about what I say. I have only one thing to say. Sinner, turn back to me. You are headed for danger. There are traps along the way of a kind that are hidden from you due to the darkness of your heart. They scorn what I say. They ignore my mercy. However, Though my mercy is such that I warn sinners, my justice is such that, even if all the angels were to drag them back, they could not be converted unless they themselves direct their own will toward the good. If they turned their will to me and gave me their heart's consent, not all the demons together could hold them back. There is an insect called the bee that is kept by its lord and master. The bees show respect in three ways to their ruler, the queen bee, and derive benefit from her in three ways. First, the bees carry all the nectar they find to their queen. Second, they stay or go at her beck and call, and wherever they fly, and wherever they appear, their love and charity is always for the queen. Third, they follow and serve her, sticking steadily close by her side. In return for these three things, the bees receive a threefold benefit from their queen. First, 
her signal gives them a set time to go out and work. Second, she gives them direction and mutual love. Because of her presence and rule, and because of the love she has toward them, and they toward her, all the bees are united with one another in love, and each one rejoices over the others and at their advancement. Third, they are made fruitful through their mutual love and the joy of their leader. Just as fish discharge their eggs while playing together in the sea, and their eggs fall into the sea and bear fruit, so bees are also made fruitful through their mutual love and their leader's affection and joy. By my wondrous power, a seemingly lifeless seed comes forth from their love and will receive life through my goodness. The master, that is, the owner of the bees, speaks to his servant in his concern for them. My servant, he says, it seems to me that my bees are ill and do not fly at all. The servant answers, I do not understand this illness, but if it is so, I ask you how I can learn about it. The master answers, You can infer their illness or problem by three signs. The first sign is that they are weak and sluggish in flight, which means that they have lost the queen, from whom they receive strength and consolation. The second sign is that they go out at random and unplanned hours, which means that they are not getting the signal of their leader's call. The third sign is that they show no love for the beehive, and therefore return home carrying nothing back, sating themselves but not bringing any nectar to live on in the future. Healthy and fit bees are steady and strong in their flight. They keep regular hours for going out and returning, bringing back wax to build their dwellings and honey for their nourishment. The servant answers the master, If they are useless and infirm, why do you allow them to go on any more, and do not do away with them? The master answers, I permit them to live for three reasons, inasmuch as they provide three benefits although not by their own power. First, because they occupy the dwellings prepared for them, horseflies do not come and occupy the empty dwellings and disturb the good bees that remain. Second, other bees become more fruitful and diligent at their work due to the badness of the bad bees. The fruitful bees see the bad and unfruitful bees working only to satisfy their own desires, and they become the more diligent in their work of gathering for their queen, the more eager the bad bees are seen to be in gathering for their own desires. In the third place, the bad bees are useful to the good bees when it comes to their mutual defense for there is a flying insect accustomed to eating bees. When the bees perceive this insect coming, all of them hate it in common. Although the bad bees fight and hate it out of envy and self-defense, while the good ones do so out of love and justice, both the good and bad bees work together to attack these insects. If all the bad bees were taken away and only the good ones were left, this insect would quickly prevail over them. Since then, they would be fewer. That is why the master said, I put up with the useless bees. However, when autumn comes, I shall provide for the good bees and shall separate them from the bad ones that, if they are left outside the beehive, will die from the cold. But if they remain inside and do not gather, they will be in danger of starvation, inasmuch as they have neglected to gather food when they could. I am God, the Creator of all things. I am the Owner and the Lord of the bees. Out of my ardent love and by my blood I founded my beehive, that is, the Holy Church in which Christians should be gathered and dwell in unity of faith 
and mutual love. Their dwelling places are their hearts, and the honey of good thoughts and affections should inhabit it. This honey ought to be brought there through considering my love in creation and my toils in redemption, and my patient support and mercy in calling back and restoring. In this beehive, that is, in the holy church, there are two kinds of people, just as there were two kinds of bees. The first ones are those bad Christians who do not gather nectar for me, but for themselves. They return carrying nothing back and do not recognize their leader. They have a sting instead of honey, and lust instead of love. The good bees represent good Christians. They show me respect in three ways. First, they hold me as their leader and Lord, offering me sweet honey, that is, works of charity, which are pleasing to me and useful to themselves. Second, they wait upon my will. Their will accords with my will. All their thought is on my passion. All their actions are for my glory. Third, they follow me, that is, they obey me in everything. Wherever they are, whether outside or inside, whether in sorrow or in joy, their heart is always joined to my heart. This is why they derive benefit from me in three ways. First, through the call of virtue and my inspiration, they have fixed and certain times, night at night time and daylight at daytime. Indeed, they change night into day, that is, worldly happiness into eternal happiness, and perishable happiness into everlasting stability. They are sensible in every respect, inasmuch as they make use of their present goods for their necessities. They are steadfast in adversity, wary in success, moderate in care of the body, careful and circumspect in their actions. Second, like the good bees, they have mutual love, in such a way that they are all of one heart toward me, loving their neighbor as themselves, but me above all else even above themselves. Third, they are made fruitful through me. What is it to be fruitful if not to have my Holy Spirit and to be filled with him? Whoever does not have him and lacks his honey is unfruitful and useless. He falls down and perishes. However, the Holy Spirit sets the person in whom he dwells on fire with divine love. He opens the senses of his mind. He uproots pride and incontinence. He spurs the soul on to the glory of God and the contempt of the world. The unfruitful bees do not know the spirit, and therefore scorn discipline, fleeing the unity and fellowship of love. They are empty of good works. They change daylight into darkness, consolation into mourning happiness into sorrow. Nevertheless, I let them live for three reasons. First, so that horseflies, that is, the infidels, do not get into the dwelling places that have been prepared. If the wicked were removed all at once, there would be too few good Christians left, and, because of their small numbers, the infidels, being greater in number, would come and live side by side with them, causing them much disturbance. Second, they are tolerated in order to test the good Christians. For, as you know, the perseverance of good people is put to the test by the wickedness of the wicked. Adversity reveals how patient a person is, while prosperity makes plain how persevering and temperate he is. Since vices insinuate themselves into good characters from time to time, and virtues can often make people proud, 
the wicked are allowed to live alongside the good, in order that good people may not become enamored from too much happiness, or fall asleep out of sloth, and also in order that they may frequently fix their gaze on God. Where there is little struggle, there is also little reward. In the third place, they are tolerated for their assistance, so that neither the Gentiles nor other hostile infidels might harm those seeming to be good Christians, but that they might rather fear them, because there are more of them. The good offer resistance to the wicked out of justice and love of God, while the wicked do so only for the sake of self-defense and to avoid God's wrath. In this way, then, the good and wicked help each other. Would the result that the wicked are tolerated for the sake of the good, and the good receive a higher crown on account of the wickedness of the wicked? The beekeepers are the prelates of the church and the princes of the land, whether good or bad. I speak to the good keepers, and I, their God and keeper, admonish them to keep my bees safe. Have them consider the comings and goings of the bees. Let them take note of whether they are sick or healthy. If they happen not to know how to discern this, there are three signs I give them to recognize it. Those bees are useless that are sluggish in flight, erratic in their hours, and contribute nothing to bringing in honey. The ones that are sluggish in flight are those who show greater concern for temporal goods than for eternal ones, who fear the death of the body more than that of the soul, who say this to themselves, Why should I be full of disquiet when I can have quiet and peace? Why should I die to myself when I can live? These wretches do not reflect on how I, the powerful king of glory, chose to be powerless. I know the greatest quiet and peace, and, indeed, I am peace itself. And yet, I chose to give up peace and quiet for their sake, and freed them through my own death. They are erratic in their hours, in that their affections tend toward worldliness their conversation toward indecency, their labor toward selfishness, and they arrange their time according to the cravings of their bodies. The ones who have no love for the beehive and do not gather nectar are those who do some good works for my sake, but only out of fear of punishment. Even though they do perform some works of piety, still, they do not give up their selfishness and sin. They want to have God, but without giving up the world or enduring any wants or hardship. These bees are the kind that hurry home with empty feet, but their hurry is unwise, since they do not fly with the right sort of love. Accordingly, when autumn comes, that is, when the time of separation comes, the useless bees will be separated from the good ones, and they will suffer eternal hunger in return for their selfish love and desires. In return for scorning God and for their disgust at virtue, they will be destroyed by excessive cold, but without being consumed. However, my friends should be on their guard against three evils from the bad bees. First, against letting their rottenness enter the ears of my friends, since the bad bees are poisonous. Once their honey is gone, there is nothing sweet left in them. Instead, they are full of poisoned bitterness. Second, they should guard the pupils of their eyes against the wings of the bad bees that are as sharp as needles. Third, they should be careful not to expose their bodies to the tails of the bees, for they have barbs that sting sharply. The learned who study their habits and temperament can explain the meaning of these things. Those who are unable to understand it 
should be wary of the risks and avoid their company and example. Otherwise, they will learn by experience what they did not know how to learn by listening. Then his mother said, Blessed are you, my son, you who are and were and always will be. Your mercy is sweet and your justice great. You seem to remind me, my son, to speak figuratively, of a cloud rising up to heaven preceded by a light breeze. A dark spot appeared in the cloud, and a person who was outdoors, feeling the light breeze, raised his eyes and saw the dark cloud, and thought to himself, This dark cloud seems to me to indicate rain and he prudently hurried into a shelter and hid himself from the rain. Others, however, who were blind or perhaps did not care, made little of the light breeze and were unafraid of the dark cloud, but they learned by experience what the cloud meant. The cloud, taking over the whole sky, came with violent commotion and so furious and mighty a fire that living things were expiring at the very commotion. The fire was consuming all the inner and outer parts of man, so that nothing remained. My son, this cloud is your words, which seem dark and incredible to many people, since they have not been heard much, and since they have been given to ignorant people, and have not been confirmed by portents. These words were preceded by my prayer, and by the mercy with which you have mercy on everyone, and, like a mother, draw everyone to yourself. This mercy is as light as a breeze because of your patience and sufferance. It is warm with the love with which you teach mercy to those who provoke you to anger, and offer kindness to those who scorn you. Therefore, may all those who hear these words raise their eyes and see and know their source. They should consider whether these words signify mercy and humility. They should reflect on whether the words signify present or future things, truth or falsehood. If they find that the words are true, let them hurry to a shelter, that is, to true humility and love of God. For, when justice comes, the soul will then be separated from the body, and engulfed by fire, and burn both outwardly and inwardly. It will burn, to be sure, but it will not be consumed. For this reason, I, the Queen of Mercy, cry out to the inhabitants of the world, May they raise their eyes and behold mercy. I admonish and beseech like a mother. I counsel like a sovereign lady. When justice comes, it will be impossible to withstand it. Therefore, have a firm faith and be thoughtful. Test the truth in your conscience. Change your will. And then the one who has shown you words of love will also show the deeds and proof of love. Then the son spoke to me, saying, Above, regarding the bees, I showed you that they receive three benefits from their queen. I tell you now that those crusaders whom I have placed at the borders of Christian lands should be bees like that. But now they are fighting against me, for they do not care about souls, and have no compassion on the bodies of those who have been converted from error to the Catholic faith and to me. They oppress them with hardships and deprive them of their liberties. They do not instruct them in the faith, but deprive them of the sacraments and send them to hell with a greater punishment than if they had stayed in their traditional paganism. Furthermore, they fight only in order to increase their own pride and augment their greed. Therefore, the time is coming for them when their teeth will be ground, their right hand mutilated, their right foot severed, in order that they may live and know themselves. Welcome to the Virgo Potens YouTube channel. 
If you enjoy this video, give it a like. I also invite you to subscribe to this channel so that you won't miss new content. Please prayerfully consider supporting my work by becoming a patron of Virgo Potens on Patreon and or by buying one of my books. My ebooks are available on Amazon as well as on the Apple Bookstore. For those who prefer a physical copy rather than an ebook, my book Spiritual Warfare Know Thy Enemy is also available as a paperback on Amazon. If you are interested in making a one time contribution, I suggest that you do so by simply buying one of my books. I am thankful for your support. Links to Patreon and to my books will be posted in the comments section of this video. The continuation of this work isn't possible without you. Lastly, and most importantly, please pray for me. May the Virgin Most Powerful guide and protect you.